Welcome to Books, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. This is um, what Rob and I believe to officially only be our third throwback episode. So uh, what that means is, I don't know, I guess if you're a, a regular listener, you probably noticed that we try to read things that came out fairly recently, or in some cases, um, even a little bit prior to them coming out. Uh, we have these things called throwback episodes, and these are where we select a book that's an older book. So far, it has been, um, this is the third book that I am rereading for this. It is the, um, uh, Rob is only, it's only one reread for you, which would be Perfume, right? Yeah, I had not read the other, I had not read the Layman book, and I have not read this before Correct. today, or before for this. So, um, this came up during our last holiday episode. At some point we had discussed, uh, Ed Norton's career and I had said, you know, he played Aaron Stampler in Primal Fear, which I believe is only like his second like role. I think he was in that movie, um, before this, I guess IMDB could help out here. He, uh, the movie about the, the guy that started Penthouse. Penthouse. Um, Wait. Pen, think, pen, Hustler, Hustler, Hustler magazine. That's what people it was. People yeah. versus Larry Flint. Yes, he played he an attorney in that. in that. Yes, and I think that oh. might be the only credit he has before this. Like I said, there is a way to find out. Yeah, I'm on uh, IMDb now because I didn't realize he was in that. I thought the People versus Larry Flint was a good movie. Um, I didn't actually see it. He was. That was after Primal. Or oh, was it, it after? Okay. I knew it was right around same that year. same time. They came out yeah. the same year, so it might have been. Yeah. 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 Um, and that was his kind of, um, I, I believe this to be his breakout role that yeah. put him uh, through the 90s. He was in everything and and heralded as a great actor in, in everything he was in. So, Yeah, wow. Uh, Looking at, there's some things I didn't remember, but um, he was in Rounders, which we talked about, but also American History X. Mm-hmm. Um, then obviously Fight Club and then a whole bunch of other stuff. So, yeah. Sorry to break up your flow. No, that's okay. I'm just that I was just kind of explaining how we settled on this book, and then it was decided um, the same way all important decisions are made by the flip of a giant quarter, and that's how we landed on Primal Fear. I got a lot of people telling me that they wish it would have been the, the Vonnegut book. Um, by by a lot of people, can you just well, what number is that when you say a least, lot of people? At least two. <laughs> at least at least two so we decided at fair and square listen pocket that vonnegut book for when we need uh for when we need another one i am not opposed yeah. to um to read i've read some vonnegut i don't remember a lot of it i kind of whirlwind read it probably like 15 years ago yeah when i was like pressuring you to yes yeah. yep and I, I read i think three vonnegut books in yeah. that time frame good for you man not opposed to it at all but this week this is all about william deal and here is his uh, bio from Amazon, uh, which I am going to edit just slightly. William Deal is the author of the best-selling Sharky's Machine, Tie Horse, Hooligans, Chameleon, The Hunt, formerly titled 27, and the three Martin Vale novels, Primal Fear, Show of Evil, and Rain in Hell. He lived in Woodstock, Georgia with his wife, Emmy Award winner Virginia Gunn. William Deal died in November 2006. So I don't know if you went digging for bios because I, I I put this together uh, most of it and um, so I put the bio in there. But um, on Amazon, the bio that goes along with Primal Fear, there's no bio. So then I went to another one of his books and the only thing it says in the bio is William Deal died in November 2006. And then he went to another book, William Deal died in November. T- <laughs> it took like I had to Jesus. click on like. Six or seven titles before I got to the bio that Livius read first. And then, but because otherwise it was either no bio or just like he died in November 2006. It was really weird. I I mean, I can't imagine that he's selling a ton of books. So I could see kind of that (laughs) lackadaisical attitude. But, you know, that Sharky's Machine was a a big deal book in the 80s. I've not read it. I think it was in the 80s. And it was a best-selling novel. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, Primal Fear, I I believe, had a pretty good showing as a book. And then was made into a movie starring, as we discussed, Ed Norton in a breakout role. And Richard Gere and, and a variety of other recognizable people. Yeah. And uh, I'm just surprised that there's no real update. There's another issue with this we're going to talk about a little later as far as the lack of care for for this book that I think is going to (laughs) come up later. But all I can say is that the copies that we bought, the Kindle editions, that had to move that way up in its ranking 
I didn't look, but oh, I can't imagine. So? I don't yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, bought. he's fallen off the radar. Just a little bit. Well, I'll read the the synopsis and then go into talking about the book a little bit, and then we can maybe talk afterward about the the adaptation and maybe his standing in Amazon. I don't know. Anyway, here's the synopsis for Primal Fear. Martin Vale, the brilliant bad boy lawyer every prosecutor and politician loved to hate, is defending Aaron Stampler, a man found holding a bloody butcher's knife near a murdered archbishop. Vale is certain to lose, but Vale uses his unorthodox ways to good advantage when choosing his legal team, a tight group of men and women who must uncover the extraordinary truth behind the Archbishop's slaughter. They do, in a heart-stopping climax, unparalleled for the surprise it springs on the reader. Let's start um, with the synopsis. Yeah. I hate when people tell me <laughs> that there is a twist ending, a uh, 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 surprise, as, as yeah. this does, I hate it because then you look for it. Right. You're like, um, and this oh, one, yeah, what's this the one surprise? Of the other reasons I try to avoid like, like movie trailers will do that to a certain extent. But really, if I'm going to, you know, actually go to the movie theater or even spend two and a half hours of my time on something I'm really unsure about, I'll watch the trailer. But I always kind of hate the the telegraphing the surprise. I remember when people didn't do that and surprises were just surprises. Yeah. This probably started right after like the sixth sense. Yeah. Or yeah. Um, the usual suspects. Some of those big twist movies. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen them, both of them have big twists at the end. That <laughs> people started the making sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Front and center that they tell you there's going to be a, a, a shocking surprise, you know, or, or, or a twist you'll never see coming, which then makes it more likely for you to see coming because you're expecting it. Um, yeah. I'll, um, it didn't bother me, but I, I can see your where your frustration comes from. Um, yeah, this review will likely be filled with spoilers, and and here's why: the book is 30 years old, came out in 1996. Um, 92. Is that 30 years? 92. 92. So sorry, 26 years old. Uh, so there there will likely be some spoilers. It was also a very well received movie. I imagine that a lot of people who are in there. 30s and 40s have probably seen the movie. So, uh, uh, warning ahead of time if you're already you're sold and you want to read or see this movie, you should probably do that before listening to the rest of this episode. Um, so the book starts out, and I always, I always feel weird like when we review these things where like there's like a main story of the protagonist, but there's also like a little like thing that is the bad thing that happened, like the catalyst for the story. And I don't remember if it starts with the protagonist or that little like catalyst <laughs> story, because I don't remember if the archbishop got killed first or we met Martin Vale first. So the archbishop is killed first and yeah. we see the first um, episode, which does. And at times I'm going to talk about the movie a little bit. I did not rewatch the whole movie. I saw about half of it. Just didn't get back to it. Uh, mailman is uh, walking his dog um, and here's breaking glass and some scream and whatever and, and, and calls it in. And that's essentially the death of, we find out very shortly after this in the next chapter, the death of Archbishop Richard Rushman, um, who lives in Chicago. Did you notice this about the book? I don't think it ever mentions that it's in Chicago. All right, so I was I have a whole Chicago thing. Um, sure. It specifically says it's in Chicago at the very beginning of the book. But then it does like its damnedest to make it not Chicago, like with the roads that it mentions and stuff like that. Like it doesn't feel like because like he's talking about like Lakeview Drive and, you know, it's Lakeshore Drive because like right. by the way it's described, but he doesn't use the the actual road name. And, and so like he very specifically says it's Chicago in the beginning of the book, but then like does his damnedest to, to make it not sound authentically Chicago, which is weird. So I missed the the actual naming of Chicago in the book, but I did wind up looking up the towns because there are a couple towns that are mentioned yeah. and they're visited by characters. And both of the, them, the two that I looked up, are towns in Illinois. <laughs> oh, that's nice. So, so yeah, that's kind of how I was confirming my thought on Chicago. Apparently, I just if I read a little more carefully, I wouldn't have had to use that as confirmation. Was like one mention of like either the town or like the town politics or like a newspaper it was something like that it was like chicago magazine or something like that i think that was the i don't know something like that so we start off with the death of an archbishop in chicago um immediately they 
they capture a, a very likely suspect in that they find this this young man who's uh, I believe eighteen years old, maybe nineteen years old, um, <laughs> holding the knife that was used yeah. to kill the bishop, um, wearing his uh, archbishop ring, and covered in blood, hiding in a confessional booth inside the church where where the where the um, archbishop lives. It's so a real pre- smoking gun situation, yeah. That is a very likely suspect. <laughs> so that's that's the catalyst story that uh, that we're talking about getting this thing going. Yeah, and then um, we kind of switch over to the introduction of the Martin Vale protagonist character, which is um, like he's wrapping up a case where um, this gangster that he's representing named Joe Panero, Panero. Um, mm-hmm was uh he's one of those guys that always like beats the rap and stuff like that but um the cops hate him and everything and at one point they pulled him over and just beat the tar out of him and um he was suing i think he was just suing the state and county and also like city the state of illinois the county of cook county and and the city of chicago and like um so we meet the martin vale character as he is like basically putting all of those governments through the ringer in this um uh, this uh, lawsuit and the the dollar amount was something like a, a million six and he was going to get as his, as the attorney like five hundred thousand but like the the thing was he had to, his client had to leave town doesn't really matter but like basically like this case shows that he he is a great lawyer he can just basically like move people like pawns on a on a on a board and stuff like that and uh, because the government now has this egg on their face because of this um this this uh the the results of this lawsuit they um a judge hanging what is his name hanging harry shote hanging harry shote yeah in a conversation with martin vale decides he's going to make martin vale um defend aaron stampler in this murder case because they think it's an open and close like easy you know you know they have all this like um like a profundity of evidence and they're going to saddle him with the defense of this pro bono um basically as a way of like getting back at him for uh just putting them through the ringer with all the odds stacked against him <laughs> sorry i was trying to do like another another <laughs> synopsis line there <laughs> yeah they give him a short time frame they agree to some things so that he can get ready in time but essentially um it's it's to to you know kind of put him in his place so he quickly assembles his uh, kind of ragtag team of people. And uh, here's where we're going to do some some characters. Um, uh, he has a judge that he is friends with, a retired judge, um, to, to with whom he uh, discusses case law and, and stuff and is a, is a close friend of his uh, who he, you know, brings on board as an advisor. He has an investigator who is also a uh, lawyer in training. I guess he's a law student who's a former boxer, certain set of skills uh, named Tommy, um, who does all the on the street uh, legwork for for Marty Vale. Uh, Naomi, who's his paralegal slash kind of assistant slash kind of secretary. And in this book, one time lover, um, which is kind of an interesting thing that uh, that did not make its way into the movie. Yeah. <laughs> And they um, eventually bring on uh, Dr. Molly Arrington, who is a clinical psychologist, I believe. But she has uh, she, she's a little off the beaten path. So she's younger. She's a woman, um, but she specializes in like behavioral um, disabilities, I guess. But she is uh, uniquely qualified, we find out later, to, to be involved in Aaron Stampler's case. Yeah, and so um, then it becomes, and I wasn't sure when we when we started this, uh, when we decided to, I, I wasn't aware of, I, I didn't know anything about the story, aside from kind of what I'd heard about what made it such a compelling story, which is the spoilery stuff. Um, but I didn't know if it was going to be a straight up law kind of story or not. It's a straight up law story. The 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 whole like you know, after we establish everything we just told you, like. The majority of the book up into the last probably like 20% is just the execution of the case, like the investigation and the back and forth and in the courtroom and in psychiatric evaluation and stuff. And like, so a lot of it is just like, like building a case, 
trying a case, and then all the little surprises that happened in between. Indeed. He goes up against Jane Venable, who is a prosecutor who is on her way out of the prosecutor's office. She has taken a large salary from a law firm, so she's kind of has put in her two-week notice, so to speak, and is going to be leaving at the end of the month. She gets dragged in um, and, and pressured by her supervisors to take care of this case. Um, which they promise will only be two months. It's open and shut. And she she has suffered uh, a humiliation at the hands of Martin Vale um, previously. So uh, she's also given the chance to kind of um, even the score, so to speak. Um, for anybody who has seen the movie is listening to this, they are not romantically linked in the uh, in the book at all. Their only interaction was on a previous case, which is something else that got changed from from book to movie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess not very far into the book, one of the things about they have to start interacting with their client, who is Aaron Stampler, who is this very soft-spoken um, country boy. He's like a real hick kind of kid is is the way that Some they... Crickside, kind of, Kentucky. From Crickside, Kentucky. I'm sure that you and I have both probably driven through yeah. Crickside, Kentucky. Named named that way because it's right next to the Crick. Because it's by the Crick. Um, but, uh, so like, and you would think that because he's this like, you know, uh, mountain boy kind of um, kid, they would, they would represent him as being dumb. But very early on, they show that he's like a, like a really smart kid but he's just this kind of soft you know he's got like such a soft quiet demeanor um he loves to read and he did great in school and everything but he had um left his hometown of crickside a couple years prior to to what happens in the book and moved up and um got taken under the wing of archbishop rushman when he was out on the street, I guess, begging or whatever. And he got taken in to, what is it called? Savior House? I think it's called Savior House. Yep. Mm-hmm. Which is like basically for like kids up to the age of 18, they can just have a place to, you know, um, be off the streets and, and they can contribute to the church. And the idea is like the church, they become, you know, members of the church and do stuff like become altar boys and, and stuff like that. So um, that is how the Aaron Stampler character comes into contact with the archbishop. Um, and it's kind of like, it's set up that, uh, he was, uh, yeah, just this kid who got taken under his wing, but bad things happen, I guess. As we discover more about, uh, Aaron, uh, we also discover more about, Save your house and more about the bishop and some of the goings on um, in the uh, in, in in that church. Now, I don't remember really clearly um, 1992, and if that point, I mean, I know that the the you know um, um, priests molesting children is a uh, frequent thing and has been in the news for years and years. I feel like when this came out, um, when I read it, it, it was not. Um, just wasn't everywhere all the time. This was probably a little shocking at the time to, yeah. to read about uh, the activities um, of the of the archbishop, which now is is you know is, is fodder for late night jokes. You know, I mean, it's it's common enough that that you know rarely a, a month goes by that you don't hear it. I just don't feel that in 1992 we were hearing a lot about this. So I, I think that was a probably a little controversial and a little shocking at the time of this book's release. Yeah, so, uh, and I don't know where we want to stop with this, but, like, um, I guess in general terms we could say that uh, it's it's discovered that the Archbishop was up to no good in a way that would give Aaron a reason to want to kill him, um, but the water is a lot muddier than that. It's not very clear um, to to Martin at the time what really went down, so then more investigation happens, and they're trying to track down um, people who uh, can corroborate some of the evidence they discover and stuff like that. Um, probably the most interesting thing as they kind of dig into this investigation is the, psych- the psychiatrist. She's a psychiatrist and a psychologist. I remember that because, like, oh, that, thankfully I don't have to remember which is which because she's both. 
um, Molly Arrington is introduced pretty early on, but like the psychological part of um, evaluating Aaron Stampler and trying to, to figure out um, it's introduced first of all to, to talk about whether he's fit to stand trial. There was like a big thing at the beginning in the arraignment about about that and it was one of martin vale's kind of tactics was to challenge whether he was fit to stand trial and um and then molly errington as she's uh interacting with um aaron stampler that's really where a lot of the inter- interesting stuff of the story like the meat of the story in the middle starts to happen sure aaron Claims that he did not kill the bishop, and at points he even claims there was someone else in the room. Bum, bum, bum. So, yeah, I, I don't think this is uh, spoilers for, for anybody, but I think we've covered enough of the story um, to give people a really solid sense of, of what the actual kind of plot is. Let's talk about a legal procedural. Now, I'm no lawyer. You're not. But God damn it, man. If, if if I get the feeling that this is far more exciting and interesting than law cases tend to be. Did you get that feeling too? <laughs> yeah, lots of um we didn't we didn't <laughs> we didn't get like 30 chapters of like them reading hundreds and hundreds of different cases to see which ones were applicable to what they were going through. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to say this was like Boston legal. But it's kind of like Boston Legal in that, like, you know, this isn't what being a lawyer is like. And if you were a teenager watching Boston Legal, you're probably like, you know what? I think I want to be a lawyer when I grow up. And then you'd be sadly disappointed in what being a lawyer actually entails. Yeah, it's not as sexy as this makes it seem. Definitely not as sexy. It is not. And it's a lengthy book. What was the the final page count on this? Do you I think it's. Or? Uh, four. It was three. It was either low, high three hundreds or low four hundreds. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. And it doesn't read that way, right? Like it, it moves at a at a pace. It's interesting enough in, in its yeah. law and in character interaction. To be fair, it is is pretty solid in this too. Um, but yeah, at its heart, this is a legal thriller. I don't yeah. know what else to, to say about it. You know, I know you could, might want to call it something else. And yes, there's a gruesome murder that occurs, and you know, even in the movie. Um, I watched about half the movie. I believe Rob watched the whole movie very recently, like over the last day or two. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I watched it last night in to- yeah. in in the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> um. God, just that scene where he hacks off the bishop bishop's fingers as he's reaching for <laughs> I don't know he's reaching for the phone or something, and he just his fingers just go flying everywhere. Like the pretty gruesome, but no, this is totally a legal um and, and probably a psychological thriller in in some ways too. Yeah, in a book that does explain a lot of um, law, there's a lot of good analogies for law to like have you understand things that might be more complicated, um, you know, concepts and stuff. Uh, but also explaining a lot of psychological stuff, it paces very well and it keeps you interested in what's going on. It's not like, oh, here comes another boring law thing that I need to understand to understand why this is going the way it is. It's it's well paced throughout, whether it's dialogue or, um, you know backstory a flashback whatever it is um it it all paces very well consistently um and it didn't feel to livius's point like a 400 page book um and that was one of the things early on i was like never read anything by william deal before this could be a dog i just i might not like it at all and very early on i was like wow i could i could easily read more of this guy's stuff which probably um was why he wrote it seemed like he wrote a ton of books all like like right in a row. So he did, um, he did continue, um, you know, it says the Martin Vale books. Yeah. Um, but those, those books, spoiler alert, um, also follow Aaron Stampler and they do it (laughs) in a way that's, um, both of them have elevated their game. Now I haven't given any thought to the second and third book until fucking a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> there are more books. I read them, but yeah, I, I believe in, in the, the, the sequel to this, um, Marty is the, like the, the district attorney. Ah, and, and then yeah. he goes on to an actual government job. And I, I don't remember what, you know, like, like, like the department of justice job and, um, Stampler also, um, ups his game, so it kind of follows them through through their mm-hmm. life, um, and, and as they continue to 
face off. Um, spoiler alert, though, the two of them become very, um, where they're very close in this, or at least they felt that way. Uh, the, the other two stories, they are much farther apart. And and I mean, like, there are, like, no scenes that the two of them are in together. They're both kind of doing their no. things. You, yeah. you know what I mean? So it, it's not it's not this great showdown between the two of them. It's like a, a bigger type of showdown, like like more at stake, maybe. Okay. But then very kind of disparate. Yeah. You know, so it's not like Sherlock versus Moriarty, like. No, definitely not. Gotcha. Locked in the battle yep. of wits or whatever. Correct. Right. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I guess I, we said we weren't going to spoil, but I don't really want to spoil. I, we said we didn't mind spoiling, but I don't know. I'm not really super excited about spoiling stuff. All right. Well, I mean, I already gave away that Stampler doesn't uh, doesn't die. Was there a threat that he was going to die? I don't know. Well, I, I mean, like he was he facing gotten... the electric chair, right? Yeah, that's true. So. Well. Right. I'm assuming the electric chair. Did they ever say the electric chair? They well, they were pursuing. I don't remember because I read I, when I I basically finished reading the book and then I immediately put the movie on. So I don't remember. In one it was electric chair, and in the other it was um, like a lethal injection. But I don't remember which was which. Yeah. Um, so. In the book, I think it was the electric chair. And here's what I want to address about how nobody cares about <laughs> about William Deal. Not only does he not get an updated. Um, author bio that says something other than he died. <laughs> um, yeah. I, there was something wrong with this with this Kindle book, and, and oh, I, yeah. I, I have a feeling I know what it is. So in the very very early days of e reading, I mean there was a point where I was reading books like on my computer because there weren't devices um, to read them on, and people would use early optical character recognition software, yeah. and the process was pretty fascinating. Someone would take a book chop the spine, then use like a double-sided scanner to scan books in mm-hmm. to a computer. So I read some of these, and they were very painful. And what would happen is you would have like, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, but you would have like an R next to an N, and then the, the optical character recognition would recognize that as an M. Right. And that's actually, that's a pretty good example, because I know that's what happened in this book. There are, I think, two different parts where Aaron says... Well, they're just going to try to bum me anyway. Instead and of burn. Instead of burn. And I think that was, that's why I think the electrical chair, the electric chair was in the book. Cause he uses that, that statement. And then it's clarified later. Cause he says it like a third time and it's burn. But there were a few instances where there was just a word that just didn't make any sense or didn't make sense as yeah. part of the sentence. And it, it took me back, you know, 20 years or, or whatever. It had reading books on my on my desktop computer that were like, you know, shared on various websites and stuff. So um, so I, I th- it doesn't even have like a legit can. Now, it doesn't if you want to buy the Kindle version and read it, you're going to get it. it. It maybe only happens, I don't know, 10 times in the book. Yeah, it's a handful. So yeah. It doesn't make it unreadable or anything like that. But it was just really disappointing. I don't remember the last time I ran into that was and, and certainly never from purchasing a, a book on, you know, from from Amazon. Yeah, there was three or four instances that I I recognized, but you had given me a heads up about it because Livia started reading, probably finished reading the book before I started. Um, so I was looking for it, and um, there was a couple of times where the word "the" for some reason, "the," ended up in the book being "me." So mm-hmm. that was a weird one, but that was definitely one where um, several times I was like, "Oh, it was the that's the OCR thing that's happening." So weird yeah it was just like i said just weird to buy something like that from amazon so i don't know who knows maybe somebody uploaded that themselves and maybe it's not even like officially sold through a publisher or who knows they're who siphoning knows? money from the deal estate yeah, from, uh, yeah they, have, they have now made like 12 dollars in the last five years off of, off of yeah. doing this and, and all of that was from me and you so <laughs> um talking about little things in the book that came up um i want i want to dig into there might not be something here but i want to talk about it anyway i noticed at one point in the book um they were talking about using specific words and not using words because the like the jury might not understand them this came up once or twice in the book and one of them i can't i don't think it was heinous i don't think you know you remember the heinous thing like, yes. Don't use the word heinous. They mm-hmm. won't know what you're talking yep. about. It might have been that. It might have been a different word. But Vale, I think it was Vale said that um, 
people might not understand it because they have IQs of like 110 to 120. <laughs> right. And I'm, and yeah. I'm like, that's not a, that's not a bad IQ to have. Right. No, it's not actually. That's, so that's that above may, that, average. Yeah. That may have been now, you know, IQs change over the years too. So there's a time <laughs> thing. Um, but yeah, that may have just been poor research on, on deals part. Maybe he's, well, he could be, uh, maybe he's IQist. Like he doesn't, um, he's racist against, um, people with bad IQs or something. Listen, I'm kind of racist against people with bad IQ. Yeah. So are well, you. So I think we I, all but, are, right? Even people like, with bad IQs will tell you how much they hate stupid people. Well, that's because they're stupid. Um, yeah, but they don't. When you're stupid, I don't know if you know you're stupid. That's the thing. Well, that's no, that's an actual thing. Like people aren't, aren't aware of their. Yeah. Um, looking at a random, I just Googled IQ scale. So obviously whatever I happen to click on is 100% accurate. Um, average IQ is 90 to 109. High average is 110 to 115. High IQ, 115 to 129. Um, yeah. So, like, one, 110 to 120, you're not <laughs> doing bad. And that was the thing. It really stuck with me. It took me out of the moment. It, was, it wasn't It was an important moment, so I guess it doesn't matter. But, like, an average IQ is around probably 100. So, if you're 110 to 120, you understand what heinous means. <laughs> I guess. Maybe we only know what heinous means because this book slash movie put it into the lexicon for people. Maybe. Maybe before uh, that heinous yeah. wasn't a right? Yeah. It's possible. And because it's possible. and because I hadn't seen it until now, I wouldn't understand that that was where the impact came from. Exactly. Wow. Look at you. There we go. That's my 110 IQ talking right yeah. there. <laughs> Do you, you know your to... IQ? I have no idea. You don't have to. Okay. We don't have to state IQs, but no, I, I honestly don't know. And I did read. So I, I considered like taking an IQ test a few years ago, but then I read that they are less accurate the older you yeah. get. Right. So then I thought like, uh, eh, if I can't get like a number I can actually believe in, regardless of what it is, then I don't know that it's worth yeah. going through because I'm not talking about taking like a Facebook link IQ test. Like I was like very seriously going to like go somewhere and take an IQ test. And then I was like, man, like it's scientifically. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know. I think they do. It's like a two hour test or something. I remember I read about it. It was, it was a number of years ago, I don't know, four or five years ago, maybe. But yeah. then I stumbled into that and being that I'm a, a little older, I was like, eh, if it's not gonna be super accurate, what's the point? I took one when I was in my like high school psychology class when I was like 17. So I figured that that was pretty accurate. All right. What was it? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to say you don't know yours. So it doesn't matter. No, I, I have can't. no idea. Yeah. I, I went to Chicago public schools. The last thing they wanted to do was give you an IQ test. <laughs> like that would go against the whole grain. Like, like the people would be like, are you kidding? I have a job. I have a paycheck to collect. We can't IQ test these kids. <laughs> um, let's just say I would understand what heinous means. <laughs> <laughs> all right good enough <laughs> uh, um yeah let's uh, let's do our wrap-ups i am excited to hear your wrap-up because this was your first exposure i i mean i think i mentioned before i love this book so my review probably won't be much of a surprise but i'm very excited to hear yours good well i'll do wrap up let's do wrap-ups but then i want to talk about are, are we going to spend a little time talking about movie versus book absolutely cool all right this is my first william deal book uh first time reading primal fear and I went into it on the strength of, like, kind of the reputation I had heard of it. I had heard of the movie, obviously, um, and that it was it was a pretty, like, legit movie for its time. And, and I, I kind of knew the twisty stuff that happens at the end, and that's what made it sound great to me. Um, going into the book, didn't know what to expect. And right away, within, like, the first couple chapters, I was sold. I was like, this is very well written. It's, um... It's tight. It's got a lot of information, but it makes it easy to understand. So this is probably going to be a good read, and that's how it was all the way through. Um, the story is well constructed. The characters are very believable. Nobody's over the top. It seems very like even the weird politicky stuff that we didn't talk about. It seems very authentic. It seems like what would actually happen in a situation like the one that's presented in the story. So. William Deal, I believe, just did a great job of of depicting very realistically what could happen when you have this kind of larger-than-life murder of someone who is an icon 
in their city um and and a lawyer who who is kind of saddled with the burden of how do i prove my client innocent um i've always kind of been i don't know if it's everybody but it's just kind of easy to watch these law procedural tv shows and stuff and this translates that kind of ease of 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 that type of viewing translates onto the page here it's just neat to see the process the workflow of like in, in investigation and preparing and and the execution of like going to trial and stuff was just really fascinating all the way through it's the arena where you decide if someone's good or evil so there's that like good versus evil thing going on plus like the people who you know all the stakes are out there and stuff so i don't know it was just it was great it was a it was a really entertaining story i like the way that um he worked in some twists and stuff like that and um overall really enjoyed it so let's go four stars i loved this book when i read it um i was a little concerned about how well it would hold up i've read a lot of books since then i mean i read a lot of books before it too um but i was worried that it would feel dated um i was worried that knowing the ending would really um you know make the book kind of boring for me to read and although I remembered, you know, all the major plot points, you know, there there were things in there. Like, for example, I forgot that Marty kind of flashes back to going to his hometown where, you know, some kid had just died and whatever, which I thought was a little uh, much this read through. I was like, ah, did we really need that? I don't know if we needed this. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's really well written. I will pick on one other thing. I don't know if you noticed this or not. But there are probably seven or eight people that are asked directly about um, Aaron's temper. And they all respond almost in exactly the same way. And they all say, well, you know, he had a temper, but wasn't, you know, any worse than anybody else. Which just seemed really weird and contrived that all of them said it the same way. None of them were like, no, he was a really sweet guy. Or, you know, yeah, he'd get pissed off once in a while, whatever. You know, I mean, they all kind of had the same reaction. At any rate, I digress. Um, again, I want to state for the record, I'm not a lawyer, but if being a lawyer was like this book, that might be something I'd be sad that I wasn't because it was a lot of fun to see how uh, Marty navigates the legal system um, in his favor, um, you know, obviously. But uh, it, it was uh, the, some of the twists and turns came from like how the legal stuff was handled. So forget the big twist um, in the book for a minute. I I think this book would have been, I remember catching me really, really off guard when I read it. Um, it, You know, being like, oh my God, you have to read this, you know, and not trying not to tell people why, because there's a super big twist at the end, but Delmo has a great legal story with great characters and and whatever. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just give it five stars because uh, if I'm still thinking about this book and wanting to reread it after 25 years or whatever it's been, then, then clearly it's, there's gotta be something to it. Very nice. You said five stars, right? I did. Wow. The only reason I asked that is because I have my little spreadsheet up where I keep track of our ratings. And I wanted to make sure <clears throat> nice. I recorded the right one. Um, before we go into talking um, movie versus book, I want to do a key. Do you want to do a key page update? I want to do a key page update. <laughs> let's do that. Then I want to do something else before I go into it. But let's do key page update. <clears throat> Flashing back in time to the end of 2017, our total key page count for the year of 2017 uh 18 books 5312 pages uh a really rough year <laughs> our our lowest year in the history of booked now 2018 new year new us we are 17 books into the year with 5175 pages boom Take so that, our next book will take us over 2017. Yep. Do you happen to have the other years handy? I do. I have all of them. What is the most? Um, all right. Give me one second. So I'm just going to read out the numbers. Sure. Because no one gets bored by that. Uh, in 2011, which was only an eight-month uh, thing, <laughs> right? Oh, wait. No, this is this has some of my personal reading involved in it. Ooh, let's skip that one. 2012, we had 11,635 pages, um, 39 books. 2013, we had 40 books, 12,020 pages. 
Jesus. Yeah. 2013 <laughs> is the biggest because then it goes downhill. Yeah. I was going to shoot, but <laughs> let's make this the most. And then I thought about what that meant. And I was like, man, we would have to outpace the next six months by 2000 pages. That would be, we hit the ground, but there's a lot of, it looks like, well, there were some big, uh, there were some big page counts in 2013, but also some really tiny ones, like under 200 pages. So, but there was like yeah. night film by Marissa Pestle, Pestle? Mm -hmm. 700 pages. Yeah. Crazy. Well, we'll see. We're definitely going to commit to 10,000 this year. Yeah. I think that's we're hitting right. that 10K so, for sure. Yeah. And if, uh, who knows, depending if, if we're sitting at 10K, like mid November, <laughs> you know, you never know. We just, we, just we may put the push on. Yeah. We could throw down on a couple of uh, the editions of the familiar and just bang it out. We can uh, throw back one Q84. Oh God! Can you? We've never done that—a re-review. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's, Let's not, not do, do that, that at all. <laughs> hey, so we both we both were pretty favorable on this book, right? Very. And, and yeah. I I had to look because I had to imagine this. So if you had to, if you haven't already, um, do, what would you say um, on Amazon? What do you think the average review is for this? Um, high threes. Uh, Four point five stars. Excellent. That's wow. On two hundred and thirty-two reviews. That seems like a low amount of reviews. It does, and I'm guessing that this probably had. It's probably like out of print and paperback because the only thing that comes up is like the Kindle edition. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's just for the Kindle. Now, <clears throat> I went and decided to look and see. Like, not everybody could have loved this book, right? There are some one star reviews. That's impossible. Oh, not only is it impossible. <laughs> this is. This, I'm, we have to get into some of this. So. The first one I looked at, one of them was really long, and it kind of questioned the legalese and, and whatever. And I was like, all right, this guy has at least legitimate legitimate gripes. You yeah. know, I mean, he's saying that this isn't what a, a lawyer would do. Okay, I don't know what a lawyer would do. Maybe this guy's a lawyer. I have no idea. But here's one that's written in all caps, and this is very recent. So December 26th, 2017. So somebody, uh, a G. <laughs> Johnson, um, he must have had a bad Christmas, I'm guessing. This one's written in all caps. Unbelievably poor is what it's titled. Probably the worst, Ooh. probably the worst book I have ever read. The writing was atrocious, and I couldn't abide the characters. A small child could write a better oh, story. Wow! So I was like, "Man, the worst book you ever read." Well, I know what I need to do now. I need to find <laughs> out what books were better. Yeah. And I believe it to be the only book he has ever read because he's got forty-two reviews, but they're for a lot of like cell phone cases and like DVDs <laughs> that he ordered. He's like, I'm going to just go dance on William Deal's grave. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, he did say that the movie Superman 2 was excellent. Five stars. And I, I mean, I kind of agree with him on that. I'm not. Wait, is that uh, the one where Superman loses his powers and beats up a truck driver at the end? Uh, yes. <laughs> it that is. is like the worst Superman movie. Superman's like an irredeemable asshole in that movie. <laughs> Oh my God! We've had this conversation. Yeah, Let's not do it. Let's not do it again. You know how I feel all about. Right. We can't talk about Father's Day and Superman too. <laughs> that's that's all that's off the yeah. off the so the, far yeah, that yeah, I can't so talk about. Um. Yeah. So I don't believe he's ever read another book. So I'm not going to call him a liar because uh, the evidence says this could be the worst book he ever read. It could also be it's simultaneously the best, the best book he ever read. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! Wait. Hold on. Not, <laughs> Lonesome Dove, a novel. Oh, uh, is that a Western? Yeah, which also has four and a half stars. Oh, no. So if I go back far enough, there's some books. For God's sake, can't there be any accurate reviews? I only bought it because of the positive reviews. But if I had even a hint of how slow, boring, and uninteresting this was, I wouldn't be out eight bucks now. Oh, this guy needs to be Pattersoned through a book. He can't handle. Yeah. <laughs> there's only one other book review on here. And it is for a book that I believe you read, Hannibal Rising. I did not read it. I watched the movie, though. Wait, isn't it oh, a movie? Yeah, I watched the movie. Yeah. Yeah, I watched the movie. Don't buy. Also one star, so he hates all books, apparently. Really, really poor effort here. Every other T. Harris book was outstanding. Oh, okay. So he claims to have read the other Hannibal books. But I think he had a summer intern write this for him. <laughs> This guy just doesn't understand how writing works, apparently. Yeah. I mean, I remember Hannibal Rising not being the best the 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 best uh, the best book, but Jesus. I mean, how uh, many? Here's my question: How many authors have summer interns? Like that's never come up in an interview. Like we're talking to Brian <laughs> Evanson, and he's like, "Well, my summer in, my summer intern says it's never happened." 
Here's one from February 11, 2018. People are buying and reading this book this year. That's that's the that's surprising great. thing. Good. Uh, this is a warning, very offensive to Catholics. Warning, very offensive to Catholics. This was my second book by the author. The first, Ty Horse, was good enough to give Deal another shot. Primal Fear seemed to be one of his highest rated books. In the beginning, I found the story suspenseful and gripping, and then it weaved its way to predictable and plotting. At the end... The twist would have been laughable if it wasn't presented so seriously. Instead, it ended just plain sad. I will be moving on to other authors. I don't think it's offensive to Catholics, though. <sighs> yeah, I don't think it's offensive to Catholics. As a matter of fact, because it's literally one case. So if you want to continue talking about the book, I guess, there's one bad Catholic, too. And, you know, I made that statement earlier about the church and, and you know, and how there's there's this kind of feeling that, that a lot of the church is, is evil and corrupt and into child molestation or whatever. This book really only – there was one. Yeah, just the one dude. That, that's it. Yeah, nobody else was dragged into it. There was that, like, weird nun or whatever she was that I thought was up to something. Yeah, but I feel like she just didn't know what to do. Like, uh Yeah. Like either no, she but didn't... I'm saying she was yeah she was weird enough that I was like ah oh, she when I like remember she might have been in on it yeah yeah <laughs> like like she she knows things she used to be one of the mascots nice yeah maybe something like that so yeah. any rate there are um huh. oh let's see here's one more it says I couldn't even give Primal Fear one star as they gave it one star uh Primal Fear because I didn't read but a couple chapters I not enjoy all the f words. Really? I read for enjoyment, and this book was not enjoyable for me. F words, huh? It's like, yeah, the, <laughs> it's not even the the not the word fuck either. He's like, man, I hate words that start with the letter F. <laughs> He's like, can it be primal? Not feeling good. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, yeah, this this person has read a lot of Amish books. Uh, <laughs> not no, a lot of fucks kidding. there. Wonderful, lonesome Amish turns of time. Book one. Uh, let's see. What best? To... A pioneer woman's journey of courage. Abducted, the Lizzie Gardner series. Five stars for that. Uh, How did this person stumble on Primal Fear? Is what I want to know. I have no idea. Six no idea. year Amish f- fetish books yeah that's uh, i mean this this the, the, I, i'm not gonna say it's a woman because i don't know for sure there's actually no name yeah um but i would tend to think from all the other books that that most of these are are uh are, are books that a woman would read i know that's me being sexist and probably what was that what what was said about us oh we talk um, about women is disgusting gross things about women or something yeah, we say gross things no, about say women things but... about women that make you feel gross i think is what it was yeah so, at any rate, great. Um, Everybody's feeling gross now. Not everybody loves Primal Fear. Yeah, but all right. I hope that Amish person doesn't decide to watch the TV show Banshee just because there's Amish people in it. Oh, it's don't not going to start in their favor. Banshee. Banshee was so good. It's so good. So goddamn good. <laughs> so good. Um, do you want to talk book versus movie? Yes. Who do you want to start with? The person that we think is going to be more in favor of the movie or the person that's less in favor of the movie? Let's start with you, buddy. All right. So as I said before, I had not seen Primal Fear before watching it now and um, or, or reading the book. And so I went into it. I went into everything fresh and I read the book and I thought the book was just great. And I had heard like the the movie has a very good reputation um but the movie was released in 1996 so there's always there's always like the the possibility that you know it might not hold up over time um like Livius was worried about with the book um i feel like my main objection with the movie is that it it and it was something that I was making excuses for the movie in my mind as I was watching it, is that it's so different from the book. And I don't want to be that guy. That's the thing they always, you know. But anyway, so there's so many changes to the story in order to make it, like, uh, you know, a, a well-paced kind of, uh, like, thriller movie that it takes away a lot of what I think was the best parts of, of the book. And on top of that, Richard Gere sucks. Like he's not a good, 
this is going to be my i'm gonna i'm sure this is going to be a stance i take that like is up there with my hatred of game of thrones but like that guy sucked as an actor um and i i just didn't i i couldn't get into it like and and there are other law movies um even from the same era uh that i really enjoyed and so it's not that it's just like you know of the time or whatever. Like I, I don't know if Livius, if you've ever seen um, the movie Rainmaker with um, Matt Damon. Uh, I read the book Rainmaker and did yeah. not see the movie. Really good. And then obviously there's like a few good men and stuff. So there's like legal. But oh, that was Aaron Sorkin. So that's probably got something to do with it. But anyway, I I just didn't like Richard Gere's character. It was it was starkly different than the book. Um, and overall, like all of the performances just didn't land for me. Even, um, even our, our breakout performance by Edward Norton, I was expecting more than I saw. And so that was a little bit disappointing too. So overall, like I was just really not super happy with the movie. However, one thing I will say about the movie is it is like as Chicago as it could possibly be. Like, it's obviously filmed in Chicago, but, like, down to the simple details of, like, when you're watching newscasts, those are actual, like, Chicago, like, <laughs> yeah. news, like, like long time, like, they are, like, the Chicago news people, like, Lester Holt and shit like that. Like, these are, like, legit, like, Chicago newscasters in the show. So they made it, like, hardcore Chicago, like, as Chicago as it gets, with the exception of... The cop uniforms, for some reason, I don't understand this, but, like, oh, you know what? I may have to come back to this. The cop uniforms have the red star, but it's got five points, and a Chicago star has six points. But then I'm wondering, did it always have six points? Was that age? Was that time appropriate for five points? So I might have to come back to that. I believe that, um, at least in my lifetime, I don't believe the Chicago star has changed. Okay. So again, I don't know that, so that to was, be a fact, but yeah, yeah, I don't. When you said five star, I didn't notice it from the movie. I said yeah. I only watched that, but, you know, but but when you said that, I was like, oh, that's not right. Yeah, but um, they did at one point. He did go to a police station that was like two blocks away from where I lived when I was the last time I lived in the city. Um, people who are longtime listeners, you'd hear all like the honking and stuff outside. Like two blocks away was a, a police station they used in that movie. That's um so that's my overall like I, I overall didn't like it. Really loved how like just like to the bone Chicago it was, with the exception of that star, which while Livius is talking a little bit, I'm gonna see if I can re- research that. I'm gonna start with the points on which I agree with Rob on. Um the movie was changed um and in ways that w- weren't necessary. So I mean like I understand that we got to get this down to whatever, you know, d- d- 2 hours or whatever the runtime is of the movie, but I think one of the endearing traits uh, about Martin Vale was that he was really unassuming. Like it was a big thing in the book like at one point, you know, the judge like, you know, threatens to hold him in contempt if he doesn't like buy a new suit essentially because he shows up and he's all kind of disheveled and stuff and in, in the movie um, you know, it's Richard Gere and it, it, it's Richard Gere from like Pretty Woman Richard Gere, like not a hair out of place, expensive suits, drives like a like a like a super nice sporty Mercedes and, and kind of I don't know if he does it actually, but you feel like he's a guy who's going to flaunt his wealth. And that's not something you got from from Marty Vale um, in the book, which made him more endearing. Now, <clears throat> take all that aside. Um, the movie on its own, I think, is a good movie. I don't think it's it's a brilliant adaptation of the book. So if you can treat them separately, I, I think it's fine. Um, I disagree with Rob. I think that Richard Gere is actually a pretty good actor. Um, I really think Laura Linney did a, an amazing job, although her character was, again, slightly changed um, from the book. And they previously had a relationship. I felt like her um, her acting was, was very genuine um, in the movie. And I thought Ed Norton did a great job. So uh, I thought the acting was good, even though if the movie was changed unnecessarily as an adaptation, you know, I thought it was meh um, as a movie on its own. I think it's a good movie. And I think the performances are worth are worth um, watching. Now, I have one thing I want to say that I feel that the movie or that the movie does better than the book. 
And although it's a side story, the Joey Panero story in the movie is much better than the Joey Panero story in the book. So this isn't giving away a whole lot, right? We pretty much are the end of Joey Panero is he gets his $1 million and he's told to move from, from Chicago in the book. And that's it. And he says, yeah, that's cool. I'll take my million dollars and go to California. Done. In the movie, he refuses to go and ultimately is killed because of it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of sticks in Marty Vale's craw, so to speak, and gives him like this little edge to really get the guys who are behind this. And we probably didn't do a good job explaining this in the book, but there are people like higher up in the, um, you know, Illinois government, so to speak, that want to see Stampler go down, not only, you know, for the murder of the archbishop. The archbishop was a big member of the community, and he's, you know, the top dog priest in, in, you know, all the land, essentially, or or whatever. So in the movie, I think the Panero story really added something to the the overall story. And in the book, I I felt like even the information that that they got eventually, you know, I don't know this, but there's also some money issues that they discover and stuff. They're used as more of a ploy to, like, get a deal, so to speak than they are really as, as a point of cutting back at the, you know, doing air quotes, the bad guys being the government, the judge, the prosecutor's office, the, the, I forget what Shaughnessy's role actually is, but he's kind of a higher up who, you know, when he tells people what to do, they do it. He's kind of like this big political player. And I thought that was delivered much better in the movie than it was in the book. Wow. All right. We'll have an update on the Chicago stars. If you're interested. I am so interested. Um, I was right. Um, so the the six pointed stars have been on the Chicago flag since it was originally created in 1917. So mm-hmm. not there's no excuse for that. Um, and anybody who so the Chicago flag I've always thought is one of the best flags, like non like non country flags. I don't know how much do you ever think about flags. <laughs> Um, I have thought more about flags since you've asked me that question than I have in the entirety of my life. Um, so there's really like so my top three non uh, American flags are the sh- the flag of Chicago, um, the flag of the state of California, and the, f- the flag of Washington D.C. I think they're all just really great flags. Um, uh, and and I, anybody who's interested, everything on the Chicago flag has some sort of meaning. Like the different areas of white, the different areas of blue, each star means something. The six points on the star all represent something different. So there's a lot of um, significance to what's really five stripes and four stars. So that was kind of neat. I would like everybody listening to just take a moment and think of the top three flags that that you're into. Um, no, no international <laughs> flags for you. Just, just um, the, the city. Oh, well, I'm talking about non-country flags and state. I gotcha. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Um, state of Arizona is actually pretty decent, but um, overall, not didn't hit my. It, it's probably top five. <laughs> Here's I'm gonna be, to, to to dig into this a little bit. I'm just gonna. This is a one line thing. It won't take very long. In review by the North American Vexological Association. Vexiological Association of 150 American city flags. The city of the Chicago city flag was ranked second best with a rating of 9.03 out of 10 behind only the flag of Washington, D.C. There you go. Is, did this come from I got the, good taste in flags? <laughs> did this come from the Vexillology Reddit subreddit? Because apparently I figured there had to be a subreddit that had not to do nothing but flags and Yep, no, it's just Wikipedia, one. but um, yeah. The North American Vexillological Association is a U.S. and Canadian membership organization for those two countries devoted to vexillology, the scientific and scholarly study of flags. Man, I should be a member. <laughs> Sounds cool. Yes, you should totally join. There's nothing they could use more than a 33 percent boost in membership. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh, I, so I'm on, I'm on the Reddit page, and, and <laughs> God damn it, I will tell you. So you've got to go on, on your own time. Yeah. <laughs> Check this out. There have been at least 10 posts today about flags, like in the last 24 <laughs> hours. So yeah, this is not here. like, I, now all of them have like it's three thriving, or four comments. Yeah. But uh, a lot of this is people redesigning flags. 
like they think they can make them better. Yeah, like there is a um, uh, the the one that's got the most comments today, eighteen hours ago, is Chile in the style of Haiti, and I don't know what either of those flags look like, but I'm guessing they took the color scheme and yeah. the style of one. Oh, here's one for the authoritarian United States. Oh, that like a United a U.S. like an American flag, but more authoritarian. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so there you have it. If anyone's still listening, that's our review of Primal Fear the book, Primal Fear the movie, um, Amazon reviews, Rob's three favorite non non country flags. Welcome to Flagged. <laughs> you guys talk about the flags; they're flying. Um, Rob, tell everybody what's up next. Up next, I'm very excited about this. Is um. The latest and greatest, um, which is, I think, scheduled to release on June 28th, um, Paul Tremblay book, Cabin at the End of the World. Um, this is, going back in time a little bit, the one that um, friend of the podcast, Jesse Lawrence, when he was visiting, uh, secretly snuck an arc of into my bookshelf. So, um, very excited about that. Uh, I just realized that when I was looking in the book earlier, that has, like, the also buy kind of page, and... We've read everything since that he's every book he's put out since Swallowing a Donkey's Eye, with the exception of that book he co authored with Stephen Graham Jones. Mm -hmm. The young adult novel. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have any questions? Because I'm already halfway through that one. Should I mean, I wasn't prepared to ask questions. Okay. No, I just didn't know if there was um, anything you wanted to know about it. No, I mean, is it as great as I'm hoping it is? It's very interesting. Um, I did read the synopsis, so I kind of have an idea of what's going on, but like, no, um, no, you don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I do. read the synopsis too. <laughs> After being like a third of the way in the book, I actually flipped over at the synopsis and I was like, well, no, this is accurate. Um, but yeah, I do want to say that Paul today on his Facebook, um, in addition to posting about hanging out with his son or something like that, uh, I think it was on Facebook posted his that this book was on a like 13 most scary books ever kind of list or something like that. Um, along with, um, a Megan Abbott book that came out a couple of years ago and also bird box by Josh Mallerman. So it is getting some recognition. I can't say for sure that this is a 100% unique story, but I will go out on a limb and say it anyway. Like this is this is some pretty interesting things at work here, and it's going to be very difficult for us to talk about. <laughs> oh, are we gonna so have a expect, big ass spoiler talk on this one? Yeah. So yeah, I, I, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much spoiler talk there will. You know what I mean? But right. all I can say is that you read the synopsis. That's essentially what we can talk about. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah. So, but in anticipation that we're probably not going to have a lot to talk about. Um, people should probably sign up for our Patreon. Um, because if we end up doing a spoiler talk, oh yeah, that yeah. could be the spoiler talk could be longer than the review. Yeah, so even for a dollar, Patreon contributors, um, you will get early access to the episodes, um, and then also our spoiler talks where sometimes we step away, like we didn't with this book, but like sometimes we step away and we. Do another like 10 to sometimes like 40, I think was our longest spoiler talk minutes of more discussion about things we don't want to spoil. So um, it's pretty great. Please donate to our Patreon so we don't have to start selling supplements that we make on our own. Like Alex Jones. Like Alex Jones. Yeah. Um, yeah so that's what's coming up. July's looking like it's got a couple books already on. I don't want to say what they are, but like we got some books kind of in the works for that. Some weird, <laughs> some, some real, a really weird one. Um, mm -hmm. and absolutely, um, the goal is to hit 10,000 pages this year. So that's probably going to be another 15 to 20 books that you're going to get out of us. All right. Um, we're going to go. So Rob can start reading next week's book. <laughs> and until then I'm Livia Snudden and I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading. <laughs>